All right. Um, so I am going to give you guys an introduction to phylogenetics and then, um, well, to review basically phylogenetics and then uh, just get everybody onto the same page um, and then move on to uh, phylogenomic trees built using SNP information um, or SNP information. So uh, well, I have been giving variations of this phylogenetics lecture for probably about, about seven years. And the first time I gave it was about three hours long. And I keep trying to trim it down, but every time I do it, it ends up just seemingly getting longer and longer. <laughs> I, so I've done my best, but this may take up for the most part of an hour. And I... Um, don't want to rush too quickly through it, uh, so I may not go through all of it. Uh, the information that I'm giving you here is more than you will need, but it's really sort of like the minimum amount to really explain phylogenetic trees. So if you find that um, it's uh, starting to uh, you know, starting to get uh, harder and harder to understand. Don't worry about it. It's it, there's, it's all basically in the lecture notes, so you should be able to just go and re review the presentation again. Um, and of course, uh, all the instructors here are experts in phylogeny. Some are some of the top experts in Canada on phylogeny. Not me, uh, but I'll I'll struggle through this and see how I do. Um, just stop me if you need any clarification. Okay. Okay, so the objectives of this module here are to uh, to understand the fundamentals of phylogenetic trees, some of the terminology, a little bit about how to interpret phylogenetic trees, and some of the ways that we build phylogenetic trees. Okay, so phylogenetics field itself, essentially, well, uh, Simply stated, is basically the study of the evolutionary relationship between a given set of biological organisms. So evolution, you know, most simply stated, is essentially where you have descent with modification. Some progenitor reproduces, and in the process of reproduces, introduces mutations and variation. Those variations are subject to the uh, selection based upon their fitness to survive in a given environment or ecological niche. So um, there is essentially this process of, of uh, a reproduction and selection in the, um, uh, 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 depending on uh, the, uh, the, whether the, 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 the variations that are introduced in this imperfect reproduction, reproduction process are um, uh, actually improve or, or may be detrimental to, the, to that organism's survival. So how what we're trying to do essentially is to infer that evolutionary relationship and um, to do that the data that we normally use is uh, DNA sequence data and traditionally it's been genes um, some genes are uh, better than others but uh, they do a pretty good job of capturing the variation and, and the relationship um, uh, between um, organisms Although that's not the only type of information that can be used in early systematics, they used things like the uh, uh, shapes of organisms um, and uh, bone structure, for example, flower structure. Um, even languages can be used to uh, infer phylogenies. And uh, actually, Rob has a really good one on, on maximum parsimony where he, he uses um, variation in language to. Uh, to determine the relationship between um, uh, tribes and uh, the, uh, I think in Southeast Asia. So, uh, anyways, that's kind of the, the the essence of it. At the core of phylogenetic analysis is the phylogenetic tree, which is a graphical representation of that inferred hypothetical evolutionary um, uh, relationship between the organisms that are under uh, study. So it's it's uh, basically that um, the the well that estimated evolutionary relationship the family tree for 
the organisms that, or the biological entities that are under study, typically genes or species. Uh, so each, the, 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 yeah, the, the most notable features of the tree are that it is composed of nodes and branches. So the nodes represent the uh, common ancestor um, of, uh, and, uh, well, of all the descendants that are underneath that node. And the, uh, the edges, well, can have variable meaning. Sometimes they can correspond to the degree of divergence between the, um, the species under study. Uh, sometimes not. We'll cover that here. So um, when we want to build phylogenetic trees, we, the data that we have access to typically is only from living organisms. Uh, not all the time. There's some very interesting studies where they use, they actually can ex um, extract the ancestral um, data. But most of the time, and for our purposes, we, we're doing is we're collecting, you know, um, genetic or genomic sequence information from things that were living or just were recently living from our sample collections. So those internal nodes are that connect them, the common ancestors, aren't, we don't have data for them typically. What we're trying to do is to use the data that we do have to try and infer those nodes, the connectivity between the nodes, and that uh, eventually uh, gives us ultimately our, our phylogenetic tree that makes the, that represents the, um, the ancestry of all of the uh, organisms that we have data for. So the the data that we have are represented um, at the tips of the tree, okay, the branches, uh, or, or well, the very edge of the tree called the leaves, um, also sometimes called the uh, uh, OTUs or operational taxonomic units. So the the process of of evolution is, um, and the trees that are used to represent them, they do make this a uh, couple of of important assumptions that don't always hold. One of the most important ones though is that, they're, that they're, the trees are bifurcating, which means from every node they will have two and only two descendants. There. So so the tree itself is the structure to that that we use to impute the evolutionary history of that group of sequences or that group of organisms. We have the, the nodes and the branches. I mentioned the terminal nodes are called leaves or operational taxonomic units. It's called that less so because that's been, that phrase has been co-opted in metagenomics and it kind of starts to confuse people, but uh, you'll see it uh, occasionally here in this lecture. So, uh, remember, so the, and the OTUs are the ones that we have the data for. Those are the ones that exist right out on the tips of the tree, the leaves or the terminal um, branches. Um, yeah, and uh, so they are, and they're connected to each other and, and by their nodes which are the common ancestors for those descendants and the branching pattern is bifurcating. Sometimes you can see you might witness a tree that has more than two um, branches off of coming off of one single node. So that's um, referred to uh, as a polytony and uh, it can be uh, one of two types, a hard polytony or a soft polytony. So a soft polytony is when you don't have enough information to be able to determine the actual bifurcating relationship between a group of organisms. There's just, there's no, there's no uh, informative data that can separate them all. They all look sort of the same. Um, uh, they all look like they're equally um, uh, evolved from their common ancestor. So that's called a, a soft polytony. Sometimes you'll see them when you see an entire clade will be represented just by a triangle in a, in a phylogenetic tree, and that's also called a, a soft polytony. Sometimes you can have a hard polytony, and there are rare instances where organisms will, instead of speciating into two different species, they speciate into three different species. This can occur from sometimes from unusual phenomena, like if there, say, is an, uh, uh, an earthquake or something like that, can to where a group of organisms that are, that are um, 
geographically restricted end up basically being separated out into multiple different areas, more than say two, like three or four, and then they're allowed to evolve on their own. They basically have one common ancestor that can evolve maybe three or four different um, uh, progeny, and so that's called a hard polytony. Okay. okay, so there's two types of trees. Uh, in, in phylogenetics, the cladogram or cladogram uh, and um, a phylogram. So the cladogram is the simplest type of tree. It, it only shows the relative recency of the um, of the common ancestry. So uh, it doesn't give you a sense of how much they've diverged from each other relatively. Only the which um, descendants are um, associated with which uh, common ancestors. So the important information in a cladogram is the topology of the tree, okay? Uh, not the distances between the branches. In this example, we have three OTUs. That's the information we have data for. And we should, and it tells us that a and B have a common ancestor, and that that common ancestor, uh, they share that, co that common ancestor more recently than um, either A or B shares with C. Okay, if this is a, well, we'll talk about rooted trees, what we would basically say is this, this is the most ancient common ancestor, and then this is the most recent common ancestor. There. Phylograms will show the same information. The topology is and uh, the organization of that tree determines the uh, relationships between the progeny and their, um, their and their ancestors. But the length of the branches um, gives us additional information about the about the, the, the amount of, of that they've diverged from each other. So, in this example here, we have again three OTUs. Um, or three taxa, and in this tree it shows us that one um, organism has acquired more substitutions, um, well in A, has acquired more substitutions than B, um, in the time since they shared a common ancestor. So there's only, you can see there's like a lot of divergence here between A and B, um, whereas there's very little divergence here between the ancestor of A and B um, and C. Okay. And the way that we determine that is uh, by counting up the number of, uh, well, this, uh, well, the, the number that represents the amount of divergence between them. So between A and B, we have four and two. So we have a relative distance of six. Um, whereas in um, between A and C, we have, well, we also have six, but between B and C, we only have four. Okay, questions about phylograms? Okay, so stuff here is pretty easy. Uh, the, it, it, trees can be in any orientation. It doesn't really uh, affect their interpretation. So if they're horizontal or vertical, it's really just an arbitrary means of, uh, of, of orienting a tree. It has nothing to do with the information that they contain. Uh, the order of the leaves are also not informative. So, and that people sometimes find a little bit more surprising. But it's really only the connectivity of the nodes um, that are informative. And what we can do is, and this actually gets done a lot, and you'll see some of this more interesting um, uh, examples of this in Rob's lecture, uh, that you can rotate the branches to get new orders between the, uh, the taxa but you haven't changed the uh, the evolutionary relationship that they that they have between them. Okay, so any any node you can rotate around any node and you can preserve the information in the tree. Okay, so trees can be rooted or unrooted, and uh, this. Uh, has to do basically with determining the absolute ancestry um, uh, and the order of descent of the of the collection of organisms that you're studying. So the root is the ancestor of all of the organisms in your tree and if you have a, a, a tree with a root it will give you that absolute ancestry from older to newer. Okay, that's uh, 
an, uh, an absolute order of descent. And this is important to remember. Um, that information you don't always have when you're doing a, 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 a phylogenetic tree building exercise. In fact, in, under most circumstances, you don't have that information. In which case, you have an unrooted tree. And an unrooted tree does not give you the absolute order of descent. Only the relative orders of descent between the organisms that are, that are, are studied. And so that's less informative than a rooted tree. Um, and sometimes in order to, um, to convey that a tree has, does not have a root, it will be depicted in what's called a radial format here. It's kind of, this doesn't do a great job of showing, but it's kind of like a star pattern. Okay, so here again, just a little bit of a comparison. Rooted versus unrooted trees. A rooted tree will give you the actual, the absolute order of ancestry, that order of descent. So here, in this rooted tree, you can see that um, you have your most, the data, the, your taxa, which you have data for. And so modern, you have this modern species two and modern species three. This is the ancestor of two and three. And this is the ancestor of one, two, and three. And then this is the ancestor of one, two, three, and four. Now, if you don't have a rooted tree, then this is all the information that you have here. You can't tell which um, uh, which organisms are ancestral to which other organisms. Only that uh, they're their relative um, ancestry to each other. Does that make sense? Okay. So, how do you root a tree? Um, there's a number of ways to root a tree. The, one of the simplest ways is to take an, an additional organism that you know is ancestral to the rest and use that to build the tree. And because you know that it is the ancestor to all those other organisms, you can determine the root. You basically are placing it at, at the root. So in this example here, we have zebra fish, chimps, humans, and cows, and uh, well, well, three are mammals, one is not, right? So we know that the zebra fish is ancestral to the mammals, and we can add a root here. And in this case, now we have determined the absolute order of the of descent from between the four um, uh, these four species. Uh, so uh, in our world of microbial genomics, uh, you typically, what you would do is you would just grab an organism, if you're working, and you typically are working with a lot of, or, of, of organisms, a uh, population of, of, of genomes that are from the same species or maybe even from the same subspecies. And so it's a pretty simple matter if you want to root your tree just to go into uh, the you know, the, the gen bank and choose something from uh, if, from another species, but within the same genus. And then that one basically is going to be ancestral to everything with, with that's all of the same species. It's easy to, to root a tree that way. Um, if you don't have a suitable, uh, th those can be problematic because they can make it difficult to build a tree that way if they're too divergent. But if um, uh, in those cases, there are alternate procedures to build a, a, or to root a tree um, if you have molecular clock data and uh, some and uh, software, uh, phylogenetic tree building software that can incorporate uh, in time information into the analysis, then you can uh, essentially uh, infer the root of the of the tree um, without um, having to add an outgroup. It's less commonly done, uh, but. Uh, but it can be done with, with programs. Well, these are where we start to talk about these Bayesian programs like Beast or Mr. Bayes, but they, they, they can be done. So, okay, that kind of covers a lot of the introduction to, um, to the trees. Now we're gonna start, and a little bit about their interpretation. We wanna talk a little bit about how we build them. Um, the, uh, the important concept here is that the number of possible trees grows uh, geometrically with the number of organisms that you want to study. So this is the 
uh, the equation that defines the size of the trees. But if you take a look here, you can see how quickly the number of possible trees goes with as the uh, number of, of, of organisms that you want to study grows. So for if you have three, um, there's only one tree that can depict three OTUs. There are um, three trees that can be depict that can be that depict four OTUs. Fifteen for five, two thousand for ten. Um, I think uh, it's somewhere in the order of about twenty-five to thirty OTUs, where the number of possible trees will be greater than the number of atoms in the universe, something like that. Uh, I may be wrong, it's, but it's on that order. So it really, um, building trees, well, intelligently, there's some, some ways are better than others. What we, uh, and so, but keep in mind that uh, there are lots of possible trees that you can build with your, with your taxa, and you, what you really want to do is to try and build one that's correct. So there's gonna be, well, one that's probably most correct, and others that, that may not be, um, and there's going to be a lot that are not. And kind of find, trying to find your way through that is going to be a little bit of a difficult problem. The problem, um, the the process of building a tree, in essence, um, using modern tree building techniques, is to take a multiple sequence alignment that we have up here, and uh, sometimes a model of evolution. Sometimes it's assumed, and sometimes it's um, explicit, which can give you information about how the nucleotides or the amino acids are um, mutating uh, within that, collect, that that data set, and their rate, for example, their rates of mutation, or whether it's hidden mutations, etc. Lots of we'll we'll take a look at some variations of those models later on, uh, but with that combination of that multiple sequence alignment, which is the data, okay, and your model of evolution and some type of algorithm, uh, typically some type of clustering algorithm, you can use the data and that evolutionary model to build your tree. I will take a look at uh, a bunch of, a couple di different ways to do this. And in the past, if pre people are, in the past I would give an explicit example going through all the way through to show you how to build a tree. Because even though it seems complex, it actually can, it, well, in, for most cases it's pretty, it's actually pretty straightforward, but it does take up a lot of time. If anybody's interested in seeing, uh, you know, a little bit more detail about how to actually build trees, uh, you can come talk to uh, to Rob later. So uh, there's essentially two major, well, three major types of, of tree building techniques. One is called distance based. One is called character based. There's a third one, which is Bayesian. Uh, we'll cover those ones. But the, the distance-based methods are the ones that are um, pretty straightforward to understand um, and uh, very quick to build. And the idea of these are, uh, well, the, the central kind of data set, data structure used in these distance methods are, is, is something called a distance matrix. Or what we take a look at in, the, in our multiple sequence alignment for the numbers of differences that we see in a kind of an all against all comparison. And then we can use that information to infer our tree. And uh, so the, uh, a common and very simple type of tree building method that takes into, uh, that uses a distance matrix um, to build uh, a tree is called the UPGMA tree or the unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean. There's another one called neighbor joining. We'll talk about that in a sec. So, uh, essentially what we do, the, 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 this procedure here, is to take a look at the numbers of differences that we see in all the sequences and compare them to each other. So in, if we take a look at the number in between A and B, we can see there's one difference here, two differences here, three differences here. These are all the same. So there's three differences between the two, and we pop a little three into our distance matrix there. Do the same thing for all of them, and then all against all comparison, and then you'll fill out the matrix like you see here. Once you have your distance matrix, the, 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 the next step is to try and come up with a tree that will um, incorporate all of those distances so, uh, so that they map one to one to each other. That's the idea of it. But 
it turns out that it's not so straightforward. It could be the case that there is no tree that can exactly explain the distance matrix that you provide. Okay, but so what you want to do is try and come up with one that's pretty close. So if you have, um, well, the, if you have, uh, you know, a, a distance matrix here, you can use it to generate a tree. Um, and you can use the in, uh, that distance information to supply, um, you know, the, the, the divergences between on the, uh, the branches of the tree. But it may not be the case that they're all going to add up to each other. So every possible distance between each other is going to be mapped effectively to that back to that distance matrix. So what you want to do is come up with the best fit. And that's basically trying to minimize the, the sum of the differences over the between the tree and the distance matrix. And that's called Archivalli's Forza criteria. Um, so but finding that best fit, yeah, so, so it turns out that, that it is, well, it's a hard problem. In computer science terminology, it's called NP hard. Does anybody know what that means? Well, I'm not a computer scientist, but my, I think my understanding of it is that it cannot be, the only way to guarantee that you found the best answer is to evaluate every possible solution. It's the only way. Unless there's a well, I'm not going to get into it. I don't have time to, but that's the idea of it. It's a, so you can use a brute fourth, fourth, fourth method to evaluate every possible tree and see which one is closest to my, my distance matrix. But remember, when you have 10 OTUs, you have 2 million trees to evaluate, and that's going to take a long time. So the brute force method is probably not the best method, which is why we want to come up with other more simple methods that, although they will not guarantee that they're going to build the correct tree or the most correct tree, they do a pretty good job of getting us close enough. So, so the UPGMA method is essentially an iterative clustering method that takes a look at, the, at that distance matrix and it essentially just starts to combine the two that are the most similar to each other that have the least distance between each other and into a little into a, a into a, and assign a most recent common ancestor to it so in this case here you can see that if the distances are here between these two are the same here then it will draw a little circle around them then it will look for it say where's the next smallest distance Here's another small distance between these two OTUs in our little distance space. So it'll draw a circle there. And they'll say, now what's the next smallest distance? It turns out it's between this OTU and this collection. So it'll draw a circle there. And then finally, it's this collection here and this collection here that are the most um, similar. And so it draws another connector around that. And then that's your tree. And that's essentially what it's doing here. It's just assigning the common ancestors between the two um, uh, uh, organisms in your tree that have the smallest distance from each other iteratively until you get a tree. So it's the uh, advantages of it is extremely quick. So you can see that there's only really a limited number of operations before you can be able to like a finite linear number of, of operations that are involved in connecting up your tree. So one ancestral sequence per step. The last inferred ancestor has made the root of the tree, and so you are inferring kind of a root in the tree, and that's not really, cannot, may not be true. Um, it also is, assumes that all the lineages evolve at the same rate. It kind of just connects them equally together, and so the branch lengths are always the same. That's called an ultrametric tree, like, oh, it, it, which says everything is just dividing and evolving away from each other at the same rate. Probably not true. Um, so, yeah, so that's not really a, it doesn't build the most accurate trees, but it will very build you a very quick tree. So it's good to use when you're working with large numbers of, uh, of, of elements in your, uh, in your phylogenetic tree. Huh. So neighbor joining is a, an improvement over UPGMA trees, um, especially no, most notably because it can assign different relative branch lengths to the uh, to well uh, in in the process of of building that tree. So, <clears throat> whereas UPGMA is just looking at the two closest neighbors, the neighbor joining tree 
tries to take into account the relative distances between all of the um, uh, the uh, the taxa in your uh, in your tree. So he, it starts with this the same type of processes for building a, a, a UPGMA tree where you make a distance matrix, um, and uh, but then it kind of takes a different and what it will do is use this information to create a second matrix called a Q matrix. And then the Q matrix is basically, a, it's what it's looking for is kind of a distance from each OTU to sort of the center of mass of all of the different OTUs. Okay, so it will um, uh, effectively give you a value that um, will tell you whether uh, the to the degree to which two um, of the of the OTUs or the taxa are are similar to each other and far away from the rest of the taxa, and it maximizes that distance. So when you have that information, you it allows you rather than to just sort of equally attach the two at an equal distance like UPGMA does, it can it can say these two are have a relative distance from sort of the center of mass, and so that means I can asymmetrically place that node between the two. So instead of having a distance of, of one and one on each new branch that you're connecting, you can put say one and four or one and five because you basically have this additional information. So you do this and you start out with a tree, it's called a star decomposition um, process because the tree itself is first depicted as in a, a star topology or a polytony. Um, then as you go through that process of, of analyzing that key matrix and assigning the most common recent ancestors, you can you decompose that star tree into a bifurcating tree um, iteratively until the tree is completely resolved. And so at this stage here, you have a tree um, that, um, well, is unrooted, but it has assigned different variations uh, um, and, and well different branch lengths to the to the different um, uh, branches in the tree that correspond to the rates of evolution of those OTU from each other. Okay so so it's a an improvement over the UPGMA approach. Okay it also is not guaranteed to find the most optimal tree um, but it uh, you know it, it, it works through um, just through through trial and error, basically, has been shown to, to be a, a very good, um, very accurate method. You will see a lot of neighbor joining trees in the literature, especially um, for large trees. Okay, so that um, that sums up the distance methods. I have a little slide here. I'm not going to, I just because I just explained it, I'll just leave it for you guys to maybe read later if you want to read that summary. But yeah, go ahead. So if, if you have to review a paper and right, you see a new there. So what's your thought about that? It depends on what they are. It, it, whenever I'm reviewing any paper, basically the my overriding motivation is to make sure that the conclusions are supported by the data. Okay, so if they have a UPGMA tree, it's fine as long as the conclusions that they draw from it are supported from that data. Right, so yeah, it really it, it just it, it depends if they were trying to. It's, it's some uh, I think sometimes people might be trying to they might overreach a little bit, you know. But uh, uh, I would be skeptical that if they were to use a UPGMH to identify the most recent or the common ancestor of all of the um, species in the, you know, in the collection. Something like that, but most people who are going to build a UPGMA tree are are doing it because they do want to sort of a quick, rough and dirty look at what the uh, that relationship could be um, in the w when using a large collection. Are there any other examples of one? It's um, advantageous to use UPGMA tree. Maybe just when you don't have much additional information available to you, right, about the rates of evolution. Nobody uses it. I, I don't see 
asking because I, I'm working on a project right now and the person I'm working with keeps giving me UPG and retreat and I'm like, why are you doing this? So it's just because it's in China, this is what, you know, it's plug and play. It's triage level. I think it's a medium based on what you use Evolutionary model uh, for, for accounting for different substitution rates of different right. things, et cetera. So, like, PFG. Well, it's just clustering stuff because you have a whole bunch of characters and you want to generate some form of relationship. Uh, you want to have a picture of the relationships in the data. And it's not, you know, it's, it's certainly a, what you have to understand the limitation, the extreme limitation. Yeah, on that point, um, in the States, with the PulseNet through CDC, yeah. um, we're doing whole genome MLSD, and it's allelic distances. Yeah. yeah. So that's when we're uh, invoking UPGMA, whereas uh, it makes perfect sense in that. Sure, sure. And also, UPGMA is very common to cluster uh, like fingerprinting data and also microsatellites. So it's still, like, it's difficult to use the likelihood to estimate microsatellites. I understand. So PFGE is like where you're just looking at restriction digest band patterns. Now those are you can cluster those together, um, but if you you might be making too much of an assumption that the number of differences that you see in the band patterns are related to the degree of divergence of the organisms, because it could be happen as a, you know, as a, essentially a random encounter uh, of an incorporation of a phage or something like that. And so things that might look very distant to each other are actually very close to each other. And so a UPGMA tree, which doesn't make those assumptions, will, you know, can, what would be, be a more unbiased representation of that, that type of data set. Let's move on. So, okay, so we've covered the distance-based methods. Um, now, the character-based methods are an alternate um, and some people feel more accurate um, method of building a phylogenetic tree if you have that data available to you. There are two major types. <coughs> One is called maximum parsimony and the other is called maximum likelihood tree. And so the maximum parsimony approach involves finding trees that describe the, well, the data, the multiple sequence alignment in the fewest number of, of well, evolutionary changes along um, within um, contained in that tree. Um, maximum likelihood is involves finding a tree that maximizes the probability of that uh, well of, of the that the tree would have been produced from the data set. And so you can include probabilistic models <coughs> of sequence evolution into a maximum likelihood tree. And so one of the one of the big advantages of that. So let's take a look at maximum parsimony. Just to, I don't, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to give you a kind of a, a, a sense of how it works. Here's our multiple sequence alignment um, of four um, taxa, and we're so we're asking the question, you know, which tree explains this in the simplest way, with the least number of evolutionary changes required? Well, we know that from four, if you have four. OTUs or four taxa that you there's a maximum number of three trees that you can build. So let's build them and then we place those um, uh, the characters on the tips of the tree in all the for all the different possible trees and then we'll look to see which tree can give us the can give us back that column of data in the least amount of changes. Characters. So the question is, which tree explains these in the simplest way? We've taken the data here, so one, two, one is A, two is A, three is G, and four is G. And these are all the different ways that we can arrange one, two, and three, four. We place the characters, the corresponding characters here, and now we basically got all the different combinations, the, um, the possible G combinations. Now we kind of have to try look and see how do we get from, from, from one character to the other character okay, um, within this tree. What type of evolutionary change had to happen? This A 
and this, the common ancestor of, the, of these, um, uh, well, of these A's at this position would can still have an A, and these ones would have a G. So you'd have to have some type of the ancestor would have had had an E to G transition in there. Okay, here in this arrangement, you would have to have an A to G transition and uh, uh, to map to or to uh, to reconcile this branch here and then you'd have to have an A to G transition to reconcile this branch here. So now you have two changes in this tree that are used to explain the tree, etc. In all of them, except for this one, you have two changes that are required to explain the tree. So which is the simplest tree? It's the first one, right? That's right. So this is our tree. Um, best tree for column one. Now we have to go through um, column two and three, four and five, right? And we're gonna find which tree is the best explanation for each column. And then at the end, we just count up the number of um, uh, trees that were the best for each column and find out which one is has the, lo the smallest number of changes. And it turns out if we do that exercise, it, it's the first tree it's our most parsimonious tree. Only five total changes had to happen. Okay, so interestingly, there's um, one position here. If you take a look here, you can see it kind of makes sense because you've got A's here at the top, G's here at the bottom, T's at the top here, um, or no, where is the other one? A's, A's. Oh, T's here and C's here. So splitting them right down the middle seems to make a good sense, and that's where what we did in that for that first tree. The problem is in position three here where that actually doesn't make sense. Okay, and that's why we don't get this tree basically is the best tree in position three. We have um, this, uh, pos this second tree here actually explains it with only one change. So that snip is called a homoplastic snip. It's basically something that is not consistent with the ancestry um, uh, the, well, of, of, of the inferred by that tree. Okay, so homoplasies are uh, kind of, it's like when some things that look together in the descendants that weren't together in the ancestor. Okay, uh, so it's used often to describe convergent evolution. Um, so the formation of the eye has been hypothesized to have occurred independently at least 10 times. So. Our eyes did not, uh, we don't share the same genes that uh, gave rise, the genes that gave rise to our eyes and gave rise to octopus eyes are not the same genes. They don't have common ancestors. So those arose independently, but well, sight's important, so important to for life that, you know, these kinds of things can, will, and will arise, right, in, in order to be, to, because they're the most fit for, for a certain scenario, even though they don't have to um, arise from a common ancestor. Okay. All right. So, uh, so that so that's maximum parsimony, and uh, you can see that you know for a given alignment, there can be more than one tree. Um, if you have a small number of, of OTUs, you can just you know build all the different trees and do all those calculations. But as you guys know, the number of trees explodes as you go up to very large numbers of trees, and so now you have to use these kind of these pruning algorithms to try and figure out if there are some trees that are or some sets of trees that you can safely ignore because you know that other sets of trees are always going to be better. So, so there's a kind of a branch and bound algorithm that's that's used essentially to start uh, trimming out all the possible the 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 uh, the neighborhood of possible trees into basically a, a smaller neighborhood of optimal trees, and that works pretty good for for maximum parsimony. Maximum likelihood also kind of works the same way where you're going to go column by column and you're going to try and evaluate you know the, the what, what the best tree is um, but now you get you in can incorporate directly um, you can do this for neighbor joining trees as well but um, the it's a lot more intuitive uh, for maximum likelihood that you um, in fact it requires it that you have to have a probabilistic model of evolution so that you can start to actually create 
like probabilistic formulations and uh, uh, that to to mathematically and quantitatively calculate what the best tree is rather than just you know using this like smallest number of changes wins type of approach so in this approach here and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look again at the first column and we say, okay, here's the, you know, the enders can have a bunch of different trees. Um, but instead of just looking and saying like when an A to a G um, a substitution is the same thing as an A to a C or, uh, or an A to a T, now we can say there's, those may not happen with equal probability. They may, and in fact, they don't. Um, so let's incorporate a model of evolution that can actually assign the relative um, probabilities of, of different mutations, okay? Uh, that's where that model of evolution comes in. So, <clears throat> there's, uh, the one of the simplest models of evolutions is, is one that can incorporate transitions versus transversions. So that's a purine, a transition, I think is the purine to purine or purine to purine. Yeah, um, exchange. So, and that is a, um, a C to a an A or a no it's a that's an A to a G or a T to a C because they have similar structures during um, uh, uh, when you're uh, uh, when when the, the when a cell base um, is under uh, undergoing um, uh, reproduction and uh, the it can you can swap those bases more easily than you can if, if, um, if you're swapping the more different um, skeletons here. So uh, transversions where you're getting, you know, these, uh, well, two ring to one ring um, swaps, they occur less often because they're just not tolerated very well. Um, also, it turns out in coding sequences, the, um, they're, the uh, a transition or or a purine or pyrimidine switch um, more often gives rise to a uh, silent mutation, so that it's not doesn't it's not reflected in the coding sequence. It's basically it's just not doesn't give an amino acid change, and so that's easier to tolerate. Less it's not subject to the same type of selection pressure, so those will accumulate actually more often. Even though there's a two to one chance of getting a a, a transversion just on, based on the simple <laughs> odds. The, the way that it actually works out is that transitions are observed about twice as often as just transversions. So you can incorporate those, pro those probabilities into your evolutionary model here and calculate what those, you know, the, the probability of getting those an A to a G translation or, or, or an A to a T translation, etc. right? Um, directly into your uh, into your calculation here. So here's your probability that essentially is looking at all the, the possible um, variations and coming up with a, an overall possibility. Then you can, you can, you have to go through every possible tree and look at every possible transition and you can come up basically with the, the one that gives you the maximum likelihood for that tree in that one position. Then you have to go through every column that contains an informative site and then redo that calculation. But at the end, what you will have is, um, well, is, is, a, is an actual number that tells you what the, the, the tree that best explains that data set. Okay? So uh, it requires searching an enormous amount of trees. And, uh, and so very computationally intensive. It also um, uses these, uh, well, some heuristic methods to try and um, uh, reduce the amount of time, uh, but uh, it is, it is uh, by far the most computationally uh, in intensive method. But if you have a small number of OTUs and you have maybe a very fast maximum likelihood tree building program, like Raxamel, which can be distributed on an uh, entire high performance computer, then you can build some very accurate maximum likelihood trees. So which is the best tree building method? Well, the correct answer is there's really no single best method. But if you were to ask me, I would tell you it's maximum likelihood. Okay, but uh, it's uh, no really it depends on the just the size of the tree that you're building, you know, and how much of the computational um, resources, how much computational muscle you have access to. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, and really the the application for which you're building the tree. There. So <coughs> moving on to bootstrapping here. Now, when we we build a tree and we say, okay, this is we think this is a good tree. Well, what? How do you defend that tree? Like, is there you know what we're we're, we're not really saying like there's a 95 percent chance that this is the correct tree. All we're doing, especially during like things like maximum likelihood, is just saying this is the best tree that we could find. But does that mean that it's correct? It doesn't really. We don't have that kind of information yet. Bootstrapping is a semi. Well, it is a. It's a semi-statistical procedure that you can use basically to help argue that the tree that you generate is the correct tree. Okay, and um, you can use it for uh, for distance methods or for character methods and uh, essentially the, the 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 idea behind it is that you're going to take the input multiple sequence alignment and you're going to manipulate it a little bit start to swap out some columns for some other columns and you're going to rebuild a new tree from that and see how much does it look like the original tree and if the data the info, the evolutionary data that has been captured in that multiple sequence alignment is so strong that it can handle a little bit of perturbation um, that you know so and will build you the same tree then you've got a lot of confidence that you've got a good strong evolutionary signal in there okay if on the other hand you swap one column out and all of a sudden you get a holding you know out of, out of say you know 15 columns that are using your to build your tree and all of a sudden you get a completely different topology well probably those neither of those trees may you know may be very good trees and you don't really have a very strong phylogenetic signal in the first place in that alignment to, that you're you know that you're using to infer the tree that's the concept so, but the idea is to do this, well, a, a bunch of times, typically a hundred times or maybe a thousand times, rebuild the trees and then compare all the trees and then you look to see how much of them are they the same and how much are they different. So here, we're, here the, here's the process where we are doing what is called sampling with replacement, okay? We choose at random, so it's throwing an eight-sided die, I'm sure everybody's got one in their pocket right now, and deciding that, and to say, okay, this is, I'm going to take out call, this column, I'm going to use it to build my new tree. Take out, and, and you do this until you rebuild a new alignment, so um, uh, that's the same size as the original alignment, but built with a different set of columns, including possibly multiple um, copies of the same column and some other columns that are missing. Because it's basically a sampling with replacement. You just throw that die, and whatever column you get from the from the die pip is the um, the one that you choose. Like this example here, you could choose column six, one, six, and eight, and so six is getting cho chosen twice. Some other columns are, but if once you duplicate some, you're going to obviously you're going to be missing some others, and you rebuild your tree with that resampled alignment. Then you look at every node in the tree and you say, does the have does do I have the same descendants in this in, in these two trees or are they different? And if they're the same, then you add a little check mark. And if they're different, then you don't. You do that a hundred times and you keep adding check marks to every time you get a node that contains the same number of descendants. And if you get a large number of uh, of the same number of descendants that are always um, uh, Given uh, given rise to by that by that same common ancestor, then that's a really good um, uh, well, that's good evidence that you have a robust tree building procedure and that the that the trees that you're building are correct trees. Yeah, so that's the that's kind of the idea there. And so the so if you build a tree a hundred times on every and, and you see that the bootstrapping information is presented on there, typically what you see on a node is some number attached to the node. Maybe it'll say something like 50 or 75 or 80. And what that means is that 80 of my hundred trees all had the same number of descendants from this um, under this node. Are there questions about bootstrapping? No? Okay. So moving on to evolutionary models, we had a little bit of a, a small introduction on, on the maximum likelihood trees when we looked at transitions versus trans transversions, right? So, um, well, what the evolutionary trees are, are models are doing for us is trying to increase the uh, the accuracy of the of the trees by incorporating known um, information about the um, 
the modifications and the rates of divergence that can occur um, between the, the organisms that we study. Okay, so uh, this uh, manifests itself in different branch lengths um, versus you know simple approaches and those um, and and hopefully more accurate branch lengths. So the simplest model is oh um, the when we translate transferred this um, the slides to the Mac. Some of my equations did not come out perfectly on this um, um, version, but if you guys have electronic versions or the printed versions, they should look, they're, they're, that's okay, they're not too bad, um, but I just wanted to warn you that they didn't, they didn't come out perfectly. Anyways, the simplest model is called the p-distance, and what really is just telling us is, let's take a look at my multiple sequence alignment and look at the number of substitutions that I find over the entire alignment. So if you have an alignment of 100 um, columns and you find that there's five substitutions, then that would be five substitutions per 100 columns, right? So that's a very simplistic measurement, basically the number of positions that differ over the length of the alignment. So that's called your p-distance and it's just distance over length. Okay, so there's a better one called the Poisson corrected distance, um, and this is taking into account the uh, well, the what's known that you can have multiple substitutions that occur at the same site, but these are hidden mutations, mutations that you don't see, but they still have occurred through the you know in the history of the evolution of the of that set of organisms and their ancestors. You can assume that there's maybe more mutations than the ones that you actually see in the multiple sequence alignment that's presented to you. So the Poisson distance correction takes that into account. And so it adjusts the branch lengths for you. Um, and a Poisson, so the Poisson statistic is a kind of statistic that says, for rare events, how often do would we expect them to occur in a certain, in a given period of time? So uh, if you were to watch trains go by a train station, you might want to ask, what is the, you know, uh, well, in, in, in one hour, what are the odds that five trains will pass through the station? Okay, you can use the Poisson statistic to calculate the odds of that happening. The gamma distance correction takes into account, well, um, for it to, in, in terms of sequence um, correction, it takes into account the fact that you may have um, different rates of substitution. Um, and so the Poisson distance correction just says every, every mutation in every column is mutating at the same rate. Uh, say like once every 20, um, you know, uh, uh, descendants or something like that. The gamma distance correction says different, um, the, the different nucleotides may be evolving at different rates. Like the wobble nucleotide, which is the third nucleotide in amino encoding sequences, typically evolves faster than the other two because that's the one that has the, contains the redundancy so that you have more silent mutations that occur in your th in the third position. So you, c it's, and in, in the train analogy, it's like saying, um, what is the distribution of time between trains that between the five trains that are on say a 20 minute schedule at this train station so you, you expect them to come through every 20 minutes sometimes come through at 19 sometimes through at 21 22 if you model that yeah you know, if you want to take a look at that distribution that's the gamma distribution so it's the variation between certain events that, that occur in a certain period of time yeah and uh, so the the gamma correction is is characterized by a, um, a, a a parameter called an alpha parameter, which kind of determines the rate of site variation. You can choose this parameter, but it gives rise to these um, you know a pretty uh, uh, considerably different shapes in the distribution. So you kind of have to have an idea of what that um, well how of what the alpha value is for your the data set that you're analyzing which is easier said than done because the values can range between about 0.2 and 0.3 and 3.5 which gives rise to really really significantly different distributions anyways that's the those are these uh 
uh, distance correction um, uh, measurements. There's also the substitution models, like we mentioned, the one uh, transitions versus transversions that you can also employ. Okay, so they are uh, well a way to uh, to to capture uh, basically the the differential rate of variation between the different nucleotides um, and um, uh, and can incorporate other kind of uh, um, statist or uh, evolutionary um, uh, information basically in a statistical model. So that's why you'll see sometimes people will be publishing their trees as something called like a GTR plus gamma. Right? That means they've got the gamma correction in there, plus they're using a model evolution called like the general time reversible model. There's a bunch of different types of models that are out there that incorporate different um, evolutionary theories. Here's a list, small list of them. The best model, well, it, uh, that's hard to know. There are programs where you can give the multiple sequence line to the program and it will say, it will check all the different models that it has access to and get, say this is the one that best matches the data set. I mean, this is sometimes people choose to um, to to use to incorporate into their tree building. Some people argue that that's not a very good method. So the easy part, um, bees in trees. So these are uh, kind of a newer method of generating trees <clears throat> developed uh, just, uh, in the turn of the century, um, and uh, has uh, well in becoming increasingly popular, especially because it can do uh, it can do a lot of powerful um, uh, you can incorporate a lot of information in it so that and it makes your ability to, to, to generate trees much more powerful than with um, other types of approaches like maximum parsimony or maximum likelihood or the uh, distance based methods. So uh, but it is, it is a little bit of a complicated procedure. Um, I'm going to try and simplify it for you <clears throat> and just go through the basics just so you get a kind of a bit of an understanding on what's going on. So, well, uh, it uses Bayes' theorem, and uh, Bayes' theorem um, is a, well, the focus of Bayes' theorem is, is on conditional probabilities. So, if I were to ask you, what are the odds that it's raining? Uh, that would be, you could give me a probability, um, but if I were to ask you, what are the odds that it's raining, given that it's cloudy, you could, you would give me a different probability. And the, because now you are including additional prior information into the calculation of that probability. That's essentially what Bayes' theorem is. It, 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 form, it, it formalizes um, the uh, process of working with conditional probabilities. So here's an example, public health example. <clears throat> so you wake up in the morning and you have spots and you're worried that you may have smallpox. So you go to the doctor who is not a great doctor and he looks in the book and he says <coughs> that he finds that 90% of people with smallpox present with spots on their face, just like you do. So, should you be worried that you have smallpox? Who thinks that you should be worried? Maybe. It kind of depends. The problem is that the doctor hasn't really given answered your question, right? The so the doctor provided you with the probability of having spots given the hypothesis that you have smallpox, okay? And so, and he says 90% of the people who have spots have, uh, or have, 90% of the people who have smallpox present with these spots. But there are other ways for you to have spots. So you could have measles or like here, like you have a, a bed bug. The real question that you want is, what are the odds that I have smallpox given that I have spots? And that's what this notation is showing us here. The conditional probabilities. The doctor says, what are the probability that you have spots given you have smallpox? You really want what are the probability that I have smallpox given that I have spots. Okay. So, well, how do you calculate that? 
You can calculate it with Bayes' theorem, but you need to know a little bit of extra information. So we're trying to, we're reversing the data and the hypothesis here, okay? And so if we want to find out what the chances that we have to have, to have smallpox, given that we have spots, it, we, it's useful to know what the prevalence is of smallpox out in the general population. Now we know it's zero, but for the purposes of this um, contrived example, let's just say that it's 0 0.001, okay? We also need to know the just the rate of having spots. Like if, if you drew, drew a random person from the population, what are the prevalence that they're going to have spots for any reason? Because it could be for, they could be me for measles, it could be from smallpox, it could be from bed bug bites, it could be for any number of reasons. So that's a that's an additional piece of information that you need in order for you to to, to switch between those two, uh, the hypothesis and the data um, that has been given to you by the doctor and what you're really asking. So um, <clears throat> the calculation got messed up a little bit here, but the, what we're trying to say here is that the probability that you have smallpox, given that you have spots, is equal to the probability that you have spots given uh, that you have smallpox times the probability of smallpox, okay? And you have to divide that by the probability of spots in the you know in, in the uh, in the wild. So the actual probability that you have smallpox, given that you have spots, is going to be 0 0.9, which is what the doctor told you, <coughs> times 0 0.001, which is the prevalence in the population, and you divide that by 0 0.1 for the just the, say, 10% of the people in the wild have spots, and then this gives you your answer. So you have a 0.9% chance that you have smallpox, which isn't great, but it's better than 90%, right? So these conditional probabilities are important because they can weigh in on the accuracy of your answer. So um, just repeating kind of the this formula here, we have the, in different ways, we have the, the probability of the disease given the symptoms is equal to the probability of the symptom given the disease times the probability of the disease over the probability of the symptoms. In the vernacular for Bayes' theorem, they call this the, the posterior likelihood, which is what you're interested in, is um, equal to the likelihood, which is that probability of the hypothesis given the data, times the prior probability, which is what information do you already know about the background rate of, of, of smallpox, over the marginal likelihood here, which is basically just that rate out of spots out in the um, out, out in the population. So, the a third way to state that is the probability of the hypothesis given the data is equal to the probability of the data given the hypothesis times the hypothesis, the probability of that hypothesis divided by the probability of that data. There. So we've done the ex uh, the exercise for. Uh, using Bayes' theorem to calculate the probability that you have smallpox, given the, that you have spots. How do we use this for trees? Well, the, we have a phylogenetic tree, where we can denote that tau, and we also have the data, which is our multiple sequence alignment. Okay, we, And the tree that we present, that is our hypothesis. Is this the correct tree, given the data? But we don't have that answer, right? We have the data, and we can generate trees and essentially take a look and see what are the probability of that this is the correct tree given the data using Bayes' theorem here. In order to do that, we have some priors, which was just like the prevalence of having like what are the you know what's the the rate of smallpox out in the in the in the wild. The priors basically are what is the extra information that you know about these uh, well about about the uh, the organisms that you're studying and their phylo phylogenetic relationship to each other within that tree, and so some of the priors, the things that you can that you may already know that you can use to help you um, uh, determine the correct tree are, are include the coalescent, and we'll look at that in a second, gamma shape parameters, remember we talked a little bit about the gamma already, um, the epidemiology that you already know from, from, from shoe leather epidemiology, and then well ignorance. So the coalescent is, the coalescent theory is essentially the study of the, um, uh, well, the 
the reproduction of organisms that are changing in the population, where the population is changing over time. So if you want to, and that can affect the, the tree that you, that you generate. Here we can see that the population is increasing. Um, you can get one type of tree. If the population is decreasing over time, you can get a very different type of tree. Okay, so that information is if you have information about whether you're studying organisms that are sort of in a steady state, or maybe if they're coming, if there's an outbreak, or there's some type of geometric expansion involved, you can use that information to help you uh, nail down what might be the correct tree. Remember, we talked about that alpha parameter for the gamma distribution, and the gamma distribution is remember the time between the average, the distribution of the time between um, scheduled train stops on a train station, or the multiple different variations in the rate of mutations in a collection of, uh, of, of variant data in your multiple sequence alignment. So those can, if you know about the, the rate of variation and uh, the tree shape, then you can use that to assist in your uh, in finding the right tree. There's the epidemiology. So if you know that there's a certain relationship of, of a, from, from some of the organisms that they're say related, evolutionary related, and you know that others are not, then that's additional information that you can use to build to help you nail down the correct tree or decide which tree may be correct or not. And then the final one is ignorance. And this is actually used quite a bit in Bayesian analysis because the there is a lot of controversy over the way that you may be biasing the trees that you're building depending on the priors that you choose. So if you if your priors aren't are some are, are biased because of something that is not really true but you think it's true, then you're going to be pushing the trees over in one direction which may not be the actually the optimal trees. So there's a uh, one the uh, most um, most tree building methods that use Bayesian methods will at least start out unless they have some very good prior information. They will they will use um, uh, basically what's called a uniform distribution for their priors. I'll take a look at this. Okay, so let's build a Bayesian tree. Here we've got Darwin and a couple of primates, non-human primates, um, and we want to know about their phylogenetic relationship. So. We can have some, a uh, couple of different trees here that uh, are possible trees. And we want to know which is the most likely one. Well, if we don't have any information about them at all, then they're probably all equally likely. But we do have some prior information about the uh, evolutionary relationship between humans and primates. So if we are to, you know, the trees that we build with bringing those observations into the process will change the odds that we have the uh, which tree is correct here. So we see here this one, um, this one in the middle has a higher chance of being the correct tree once we include our prior information than these other two possible trees. Okay, now we're going to have to look at every tree in order to be able to find out that uh, what, what's the correct topology. And that's easy enough to do when you only have a limited number of taxa. But it's not just the topology we want to look at, it's also the branch lengths. And the branch lengths can, if we need to, we want to look at all possible branch lengths, well, there's an infinite number of possible branch lengths for every tree. That makes it a little bit harder. But it turns out that Bayes, um, the formula for Bayes allows you to do something called integrating over nuisance variables. And what it will do, essentially, if you integrate over all possible branch lengths, then you will change that discrete probability that you see here into a continuous one that looks like this. Okay, and so your you have a probability space now that you can that that's um, well continuous probability space that you can now start to sample and see if you can find the best possible one. So the best combination of topology and branch length. Here. So how do you do that? I mean, when there are infinite numbers of trees, um, then you, uh, but the probability space, basically, you know, is, is not infinite. How do you, how do you select the right tree? Well, I mean, there's, uh, well, 
whoops, the way to do it here is using something called a Monte or Markov chain Monte Carlo um, sampling uh, algorithm. So the idea here is it's also a thing called a hill climbing algorithm, and the idea is that you don't really know which tree is the correct tree so you will just select a tree at random and you will you you will provide a measure using Bayes theorem of it of, of the likelihood that it's the correct tree you can calculate that probability the the posterior probability it might not be good but at least it's a value now you then make a switch, and uh, so you can switch branches or you can switch a branch length um, to create a new topology or a new branch length, and then you re-measure the probability that that's a correct tree. And if that if the probability increases, then you are going to accept that new probability that that the new tree is probably is gives is is better is a better representation of the new of a true tree than the old one is. So as you are sampling the probability space, you're heading towards an optimum space. The maximum um, here is the most correct tree in that probability space. And by looking at two trees, by making small changes and comparing them and seeing which one's better, it allows you to start to um, essentially to ascend up to the, to the top. The problem is, if you were randomly started out over here, <coughs> or over here on these um, you know uh, slopes down here then what would happen is you get to the top here and you would never and then you would, and then all tree all the other trees would look worse than this um, than this uh, one <coughs> spot here which is not the best um, and you uh, and in those cases basically your algorithm is going to fail you because it's not giving you the optimal tree <coughs> It's stuck in what's called a metastable state. So, in order to get around that, the Monte Carlo um, algorithm will sometimes accept that uh, the, a tree that is not as good is um, still worth. Um, uh, it's still worth choosing that tree so that you may be able to uh, uh, to uh, to escape out of that local maximum. Okay, so if you were to, you, uh, well, here on this big hill here, you can see if it's going up, you always accept. If it goes down, then you will, you, if the probability goes down, what you'll do is you'll essentially kind of roll the dice. And depending on how um, much less likely that tree is versus the one, the previous tree, you will either accept to go to take that worst tree or not. And what happens is it basically will allows, once you get sort of stuck in a little local maximum, it will allow you to start to head down the slope eventually. And then hopefully you can get out of that local maximum and then back up on your way to the true um, uh, global maximum right here. Okay, that's how it works. And uh, well, you have to, it takes a lot of iterations and a lot of tree comparisons, but it's actually less than um, the maximum likelihoods and the maximum parsimony um, approaches if you be um, uh, for large numbers of taxa. So, so that's Bayesian. Um, are there any questions about Bayesian trees? Okay, I'm filled with questions about Bayesian trees, but. I'm not going to uh, make you suffer through them. So that's it for uh, for phylogenies. And now we're going to move on to the whole genome um, phylogenies. Uh, so is there any questions at all about phylog about the phylogenetic uh, trees? Uh, the lecture that I've given so far. No. Okay. Like I said, if you find that it's a, anything is unclear, um, just ask any one of the, the TAs or the instructors, and they can <laughs> I'm sure they'll be able to, to set you straight. So here I'm going to close quickly um, on the whole genome phylogenies, which we're going to start to work with in, our, um, in the hands-on module uh, using uh, uh, SNP-based approaches. So the approaches that I've shown you so far, typically they are using a small 
subsegment of a genome on the scale of about a gene or maybe a couple of concatenated genes. Um, and there's usually sufficient evolutionary signal in that section for you to be able to, to build a, a robust tree, but not all the time. Um, and because we have, you know, widespread um, implementation of next generation sequencing technology, it's, it's trivial for us to generate a, a draft a genome for just about any organism that we study, especially bacterial organisms, that we can crank them out all the time. So, uh, by expanding the amount of information that we collect to the entire genome, we can build much more robust trees. And um, this helps out a lot to uh, in the world of genomic epidemiology because um, we sometimes need to be able to harvest as much variation as possible to be able to, to make a, an epidemiological um, interpretation, especially during an outbreak scenario where you have a clonal organism that say gets contaminates sort of the, uh, the, the, the food supply system, so a single food processing facility it gets contaminated with one clonal organism and then it gets spread out to the whole country and the, um, the, the organism, the, well the, the, the classical typing data may all look the same and so it's very hard for you to be able to distinguish between the, any of them. They might look the same as some sporadic strains or they, they but you know, they, they may look a little bit different. It's kind of hard to tell. If you have access to whole genome sequencing technology, then you can tell the difference between any two organisms that differ in theory by as little as one nucleotide over the typically millions of nucleotides that they harbor within their genomes. So it's a very, very high resolution um, technology and it can, uh, the amount of evolutionary signal that is in there is maximized. So it's, it's very, um, very highly desirable uh, to be able to build whole genome trees and it was uh, uh, famously demonstrated actually in, uh, during the Haiti outbreak in 2010 where they used whole genome sequencing to identify the source of an outbreak as being imported from Nepal rather than an, an alternate uh, uh, endemic um, outbreak scenario of hypothesis, whereas other sequencing technologies could not do the kind of discrimination. So there are uh, distance methods um, can be applied and the character methods can be applied. All the phylogenetic tree building methods can be applied um, for, for genome trees just as well as they can for uh, single genome trees. So this is uh, an example of a uh, whole genome trees that are being built from the same organisms. Um, one is using, well, just a single locus approach, a single gene approach. That's the one that here you see on the bottom. And you'll notice that there are a number of polytomies in this uh, tree at the bottom that's built with a single gene approach, right? And why do we have polytomies? When do we have polytomies? Hmm? We don't have enough information for us to be able to do any further discrimination, right? Can't do any further bifurcation. There's a limited amount of information available for us within that single gene. Here's the same trees built using a distance-based approach where you just essentially do blast analysis of between both trees and collect as much the, of similar content and that becomes your distance measure. And for using that approach, you get much better resolution between the, the trees and uh, you, including single genome um, separations. Okay, <clears throat> uh, if you uh, use reference mapping, now you can harvest the variants that are um, present in there and you can use that to build either in a, 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 a similar like a distance based approach, but one that's based on SNPs rather than just global alignments, um, or you can use character based approach. And so these are the, the modern ways of doing um, uh, whole genome phylogenies in, incorporate typically either this reference mapping and variant selection or they'll use a gene by gene approach. So um, just uh, to remind you, reference mapping is where you take a typically high quality reference genome that is um, evolutionarily related or similar, um, has high sequence similarity to the collection of, of genomes from the organisms that you are interested in building a tree for uh, and then and, and for which you have uh, 
whole genome sequence data in the form of raw reads. And so for every read set from each organism, you map it to the, uh, to the reference, and then you look to see where the differences are, and you can collect those differences. So um, I use the term single nucleotide variant to describe those uh, informative differences. Not everybody does. Some people call them, um, refer to them as, as SNPs. But just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about, a single nucleotide variant formally described is a single base change that exists among two or more homologous sequences that are under comparison. So here you can see I call this a single nucleotide variant. Now most people would say that also looks like a single nucleotide polymorphism, and it is, and those are used interchangeably, although if you're pedantic like me, you actually make a distinction. A single nucleotide polymorphism more formally refers to a variant that exists in a, that is fixed in the population and exists at a, at a, a relative abundance of 1% or higher in that population. So variants can be ephemeral. They can just sort of appear and disappear. <coughs> They're not really, they don't lend um, any type of uh, selective advantage or disadvantage to that organism. Um, They're just basically just popping in and out of existence. But on the time scale of an outbreak, that may be all you have access to. So the... You don't, but it, it may or may not. But a but a polymorphism. They but they haven't really had enough time to be able to be selected for it to the point where they become fixed in the population at an abundance of one percent or higher. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know the. You, yeah, I agree. So, but, but anyways, the idea is that a, 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 every SNP is also a SNF. Okay. And so you're all encompassing if you use the word um, single or, or the initialism single nucleotide variant, and that's why I use it. Also because we named our software to, to incorporate it. There's a, a no, so these are these are polymorphisms, and there's a difference between a polymorphism and an insertion and deletion. And some people will call a single a single dash that you'll see in a multiple alignment. They might call that a polymorphism, a SNP, an indel SNP. Sometimes they'll call it, but that um, is not um, formally correct. Those are referred to as indels, um, or sometimes as as uh, divs, which are deletion and um, insertion variants. Okay, so we are interested in the harvesting of all of the SNVs that we can from our uh, from our collection of reads that we have for the organisms that we've recently sequenced that uh, we want to build a phylogenomic tree for. So we choose a reference and we start mapping our reads to that reference and then we use variant detection software to analyze the where the reads contain a <coughs> variant that is not, oops, not in the, um, uh, not in the reference. And if it is, uh, passes certain quality checks, uh, that has to do with the quality of the aligned read and uh, maybe the number of reads that actually harbor that variant versus the ones that maybe, uh, may have the wild type in it, then we can say, okay, this has a, this is high quality enough for us to choose, um, that, you know, we're confident that this is real and not just some, some sequencing artifact or some other type of confounder. Um, and we're going to choose this and use this to help build our tree. So this red, these red sequences here are from genome one. Then we have the orange reads that are mapping to the same blue reference. So that's genome two. Now we, we do the same procedure. We're pulling out all of the variants that we see that, that um, pass our filtering criteria, and we repeat until we've collected all of the variants out of all of the genomes in our collection. Now we can, well, compress those into what's called a SNV alignment, or not, but this is typically what happens, is you just take out all the variants, and now you're going to build 
uh, multiple sequence alignment that just consists of the um, the variation that you have extracted out of that collection of genomes by mapping them to the reference. Now once you have a multiple sequence alignment you can build your phylogenetic tree using any of the methods that we've just been spending the last hour and a half talking about. Okay? Okay. And that's it. So reference mapping just as a summary, it uses reads, and so it doesn't. There's no need for, for for assembling the genomes first, extracting out genes or anything like that. It's very handy. Just take a collection of raw reads, map them against a reference, pull them out, and build them into a tree. And that's what we're going to look at a pipeline that does exactly that for us. But if you're not careful, then you may be harvesting some of the 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 SNPs or SNPs that you think may be evolutionarily informative, but turns out that they are not. For example, you may have homoplastic SNPs or SNPs for like the ones that we talked about um, that can be incorporated uh, into uh, an alignment but are not derived from, they're not, although they're, they're present in the, uh, pr in the progeny but not present in the progenitor, right? So um, essentially the variants that don't agree with the, the, uh, the overall true phylogeny. And they are in there. They can occur from recombination, um, so like homologous recombination. Um, and so we're going to take a look at some of that. <coughs> the choice of reference sequence can be difficult because you don't always have a handy reference sequence that's high quality and is closely related to the to the sequences that you want to study. There are some workarounds. You can choose one that's more distant, but that can affect the topology and the branch lengths that you generate. So you really do want to try and keep things as close as you, um, uh, as you can to the collection that you're looking at. An alternate way around that, if you don't have anything handy, like from that you can extract from the public archives, would be to just take one of the isolates that you have and assemble that into a draft genome and then map the rest of them against that draft genome. At least that way, as long as the collection that are all evolutionarily related, closely related, then that should suffice to build a, um, a, a starter tree for you, which might need some an additional interpretation. Right, and there are some additional gotchas, and those are um, some of the things that uh, Phil is going to show us here in the next section. That's it.